How many of you really, I mean, we're, we're on summer and we're already tired. Man, it's, it's tough just trying to get everybody in their place and situated for summer. And I understand there's a new schedule even where, uh, where the kids will go back to school even sooner so they can get out more through the year. Summer's going to be short for a lot of people. And uh, I just pray that you'll find some time to get some rest. But I, I find it here the first week, and this is, this is, of course, the week everybody's gone to visit people and do things and all that. Uh, but w- we're tired. Man, I need some more sleep. Amen? Uh, I, I need some vacation from some vacation. I do. Uh, just seems like it, it's a never-ending cycle. You think you're going to get to a certain place and, and there's still a few more graduations we have to go to and we have to attend and, and have to do. Uh, uh, Devontae's going to be graduating from Police Academy. I'm going to be going up to University of Texas. That's going to be great. Uh, see him graduate, uh, becoming a law enforcement uh, guy. and I'm just so excited, but man, all of these things wear us out. So this morning, I've got a difficult subject. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about the, a, a dirty word in the church. Uh, and uh, I, I, you're going to have to help me because I'm not one that typically gets a little fearful. Uh, I'm pretty bold. You know that. Uh, but when you talk about a dirty word in the church, it's dirty because people don't like us to use it. And if we do use it, then all of a sudden you think, I'm unkind, or I'm trying to be ugly, or or, I'm not loving, and I'm very loving, I'm very kind, I'm very forgiving, but I'm also very bold. So I'm going to need your help here this morning, because I'm going to be talking about the dirty word in the church, Okay. Everybody want to know what it is? I'll tell you after the clip. I'm not going to tell you yet, okay? If I tell you now, some of you get up and leave when we turn the lights out, and you'll make your exit while it's dark. And we're not going to do that. We're going to wait until we come back on, and after the clip, we're going to turn the lights down, and we'll show you the clip, and uh, and then we'll come back, and we'll talk about uh, a dirty word in the church. All right? Watch this. I got a, got a big butt. It's gigantic. I'm going to be blunt about it. And you know what? The funny thing is, I got several big butts. And, and, and before, you, before you discard me or, or wince at the disgusting notion of that, I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that possibly you have at least one big butt as well. Yeah, you like that? Hurts a little, huh? Let me tell you something. Let me just tell you something, okay? Everybody we know has a big butt. And more often than not, it's the thing that actually gets in the way of us living a consistent life for Jesus. Yeah, I think you know what I'm talking about. I'm going to expound a little bit, okay? See if you can recognize some of these butts. But I have to work more. But my favorite TV show is on. But my kids have practice. But i got to tweet something. But it's such a beautiful day. But I'm just not in the mood. But I deserve a break today. You see, everything kind of interferes with my life of, of just living an authentic life for God, okay? And more often than not, it always has something to do with some sort of butt, okay? Even the littlest of butt can distract me. It really can. The littlest butt can make me think, well, I'm not going to pray today. I'm not going to think about it today. I'm not going to deny myself. I'm not going to read the Bible, blah, blah, blah. Whatever God asks me to do, I seem to have a butt for it and get away, okay? And the most horrendously big butt of all time is the butt that gets in the way of me just hanging out with God and reading His Word. It's true. Think about it. All the times you're about to open that, and all of a sudden a big giant butt gets in the way. A butt, much like one of these. But I got a farm bill, but I'm tired, but the game's over, but I read last Tuesday, but I gotta check Facebook, but I don't like Leviticus, but it's too hot in here, but I, I just don't like books, but I don't understand it, but it's boring. But what does that have to do with me in the 21st century? Those are some ugly butts, people. Let's just call them what they are, ugly. Ugly butts. Okay, and there's a lot more to them, sad but true. Here's a list, although not exhaustive, of some of the most popular butts known to mankind. 
but I don't have enough money yet. But others will think that I'm a nerd if I carry the Bible. But they won't like me if I talk about Jesus. But I don't know if God will do what I ask. But I just can't get motivated. But I'm afraid. But I don't have all the answers. But the small group is the same night as Monday Night Football. But can I just let my life speak for itself? But I'm not happy. That's not my gift. That's the pastor's job. But I don't know how to pray. But I can't believe that. But I don't know where to start. But everybody else is having fun. Buts abound, friend. But, 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 but. Here a but, there a but. Everywhere a but, but. Okay? And, and, and the most overused but of all time, but I just don't have enough time. Really? Oh, come on. We have a lot of buts. God has given us a real simple word. Okay? If we learn it, and we share it, and we teach it, and we live by it, then see, God gets glorified, people benefit, and then we get blessed. That's why we do what we do. That's the why behind the but. Okay? And ultimately, that's the whole point I'm trying to make here, my fellow butt lovers, is if your butt is bigger than your why, then your butt's too big. Okay, it's time to, metaphorically speaking, snap into a Slim Jim. Okay, let's slap on some spiritual shape-ups and hit the road a little bit so we can just manage the butts a little bit. That's all we're trying to do. That's what we're talking about. Let's minimize the excuses. Let's shrink the butts. Shrink the butts. Say it with me. Shrink the butts. That's what we need to do. And you and I can do that together. We can conquer this. You and I can do it if we start today, okay? I know we can. Let's just do it. No ifs, ands, or... Yeah. I think you get it. Well, have you figured out what the dirty word in the church is? No, it's not it. I knew that's what you were going to say. It's not it. It's a commitment. When we start using the word commitment in the church, we all of a sudden get people upset. Because when you use the word commitment, that means that someone is being examined or looked at. The word commitment never comes up unless there's uh, an analyzation of that particular person's life or what that person is doing. And then because of the lack of commitment, we find the word but and the excuses that start to creep in. But the word we do not like to use that creates the discovery is the word commitment. And without commitment, we'll never be what we need to be. And we're living in an age, uh, again, I think I told you last week I'm reading a book that uh, Brother Chili shared with me. It's called uh, Back to the Margins. If we never live a committed life for Christ, we are getting further and further away from the mainstream of what God wants us to be, and we're always living in the margins of Scripture. We're living in the margins of the Christian life. The margins is not where it happens. Where it happens is right in the middle of the page. Amen. Uh, right where God tells us where we need to be. So I want to, sh I want to share with you this morning, and I want to give you a little background because I don't want you to measure your commitment, that dirty word, with someone in the church or someone like me because I certainly don't measure up. Uh, there are some of you probably have a, a better commitment in some areas of your life uh, greater than I do. So I don't think it's fair for us to look at each other and say, uh, because here's the fallacy of this, if we start looking at what you do and your friend does, it's easy to quantify our excuses. Well, I'm better than they are, and we start to make excuses why we're better. I do more than they do. That is really not the issue. I want to use an example this morning of the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul is probably... Uh, the greatest example other than Christ that we can look at as far as an example. Even if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs and talked about all the old-time folks that gave their life for Christ and how they lived for God, I don't think you will find anyone that quite lived up to the measure of commitment than the Apostle Paul. I don't know if you'll find anyone that had given up or suffered more than the Apostle Paul. I certainly can't quantify myself, and I can't quantify anyone in this building with us making the comparison. So will we all agree that Paul will be the standard that we use today just to look at? I don't expect your commitment to be like the Apostle Paul's. I don't. But I do expect us to be able to look at Paul and measure ours to where it's at, measured against this giant in the faith. Because measuring is good. We need to consistently measure ourselves. When I was in athletics, rather, no matter what it was, or rather be uh, when I was learning uh, Taekwondo and I ended up teaching for the military, I constantly had to measure myself against a standard. The Christian life is no different. If you want to grow, you've got to measure yourself to be able to measure your growth. You've got to be able to look back and say, this is where I am and this is where I was, and most importantly, this is where I want to be. Because you understand, Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. It is a constant process. We move from faith to faith to faith. 
But we get in a state of mind sometimes, and let's just be honest here this morning, because we're going to have some fun. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna to be... Uh, the, I think there's always fun when there's liberty. When you just tell it like it is. Liberty is different than being judgmental. I'm not being judgmental. I'm, I'm looking at reality here this morning with the purpose of helping you. Because I've been in the same place. There have been times in my life that my commitment was not what it needed to be. And it, you know that commitment in everything that you do is how successful you'll be. You stay committed in your marriage, your marriage will be successful. Stay committed in your job, your job will be successful and there will be promotions. You stay committed in almost any area of your life. And, and in reality, when you go back and look at the areas where you were committed, you were always successful. Can I get an amen? I find that sometimes our spiritual walk and our spiritual side gets put on the back burner and we just sometimes forget all about it. We don't mean to, but we do. So I, I, I want to use... Uh, Paul, uh, just as a backdrop, uh, he was certainly a man committed to Christ. Take your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3, and uh, I'm going to start at verse number 7. But I'm going to give you a little bit of background prior to verse number 7. I'm going to start at verse number 3, just to allow you to understand about Paul. Now, if you've, you've been a member here uh, for any period of time, you know I love teaching about Paul. He was a brilliant guy. Paul was taught by the greatest teacher in all of Israel, uh, Gamaliel. As the, the great Jewish historian Josephus said, that when Gamaliel died, the law died. He was the greatest teacher probably Israel had ever seen, and his number one pupil was the Apostle Paul. So Paul was not just a believer that got saved on the Damascus Road. He was a scholar. He had studied under the best, and we find a little bit about him in verses 3 through 6, and we look in Philippians 3. Now, Paul's going to tell us about himself, not to boast, <clears throat> not to boast, but to give us an understanding of what his background used to be like, because I want you to understand this about Paul. When, with his commitment, what he used to do doesn't matter anymore. With whatever he had accomplished, it doesn't matter anymore anymore in other words the more he learns about God and how God, the Holy Spirit works in his life and he accomplishes things for God the things that Paul accomplished take a back seat and that back seat tends to get further and further and further the more he learns about God in other words God's God becomes the priority God becomes the focus God becomes his 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 life everything about him and everything else takes a back seat now if I didn't say any more than that and you measured where you're at with where Paul was most of us would find ourselves wanting in our commitment because we still haven't learned to kill our own flesh we still haven't learned to put our own desires to rest the more we learn about God, the more we learn that God's will is more important than our will. The more we learn about God, the more we learn that God's way is better than our way. The more we learn about God, we learn that God's smarter than we are. The more we learn about God, we realize that God is more powerful than we are. And, and Paul had these things together. And in, in chapter 3, verse number 3, it says this for... Uh, let, let me just read. He says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Jesus Christ, and, have no, and we have no confidence in the flesh. Now, he said, I am at the place where I have no confidence in my flesh. Now, that's a big, bold statement, and I could elaborate quite a bit of time on that because I put too much confidence in my flesh. So I understand exactly. You're not supposed to amen that one. Amen. Uh, that, that, that. But, but in reality, we all put too much confidence in our own flesh. In other words, we try to handle more things and we have too much confidence in us. Our confidence shouldn't be in us, it should be in Him. And that's what Paul's saying. He says, he says, uh, he says for, uh, for we worship a God in the Spirit, rejoice in Jesus Christ, and have no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4, though uh, I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh... Paul said, now, if anybody can have confidence in the flesh, I know my natural abilities. Because he goes on, he says, he says, I, more so, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. He said, now, he's starting to give some qualifications why he can have confidence in the flesh. According to the Old Testament, according to, to law, he had done everything right. When he was born, his parents 
circumcised him on the eighth day the way that the law said. They took him into the temple. They gave him to God. They made a vow to God. You might say it was kind of like a baby dedication. And he was circumcised the eighth day. So right from his very birth, he has followed the principles. And those principles have been taught him. So he understands everything. Okay? About where it needs to be about confidence and about all this thing. And he says, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Tribe of Benjamin was the second son of Rachel. He said, I was born into the bloodline. I understand, right in the line of King David, the, the kingly line. I understand all about it. I was born, uh, done the right stuff. I was born of the right bloodline. He said, uh, I circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Now, there were a lot of Hebrews, but they weren't Hebrews of Hebrews. What he's really saying, I kept the old ways. I kept the traditions. I followed all the feasts. I obeyed the law. I still spoke the language because the Hebrews had been dispersed as Babylonians had came in and dispersed them. And the nation has been scattered. Jerusalem has been torn down. Uh, the temple worship is no longer what it used to be. There are no prophets for 400 years till Christ comes on the scene. Paul said, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I still understood the law. I listened to the prophets. I followed the prophets. He said, I had all of these things to have confidence in the flesh. He says the Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee, the law of God. He said, I was a Pharisee. A Pharisee was someone who taught the law, who studied the law. They wore it in their garments. They had a little box they'd wear around their head. He was a Pharisee. He was a teacher. He kept the law. He wore it on his wrist. He would pray with beads concerning the law. He had all of the things that remind him concerning law, concerning zeal. He, in other words, he's very passionate and serious about it. He had zeal for the Lord. Matter of fact, the Scripture says, Your zeal hath eaten me up. He was passionate about this. He had confidence in the flesh. He had confidence that he was going to be somebody. He had two doctorate degrees by the time he was 21 years old. This guy was brilliant. This guy was the... He, I mean, he had a career in front of him. If anybody ever had a career, it was him. He was going to be well paid, he was well cared for, he was well respected, he had an incredible reputation. He was the star player of the group called the Sanhedrin. So he could give confidence in himself. He said, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteous in which, uh, which is in the law, blameless. He said, I obeyed everything that I could. I was a legalist. I did everything the way I was supposed to be. I didn't violate the law. And in verse 7, he changes gears. He changes gears in verse 7 because he says this, I had a future. If anyone could have confidence in the flesh, it was me. I'd been prepared. I'd been schooled. I'd been trained. I had the right uh, mindset. I'd studied all my life to be a certain thing. But then there's, guess what? One day I meet Jesus and everything changes. When you meet Christ, everything will change. And everything changed for him and his commitment. All of that training that was done in a negative way to persecute the church, all of a sudden that same confidence, that same zeal, that same commitment is going to be to serve Christ. And I believe God had it called him and, and, and set him apart to be a chosen vessel. The way Scripture says, if you read Acts chapter 8 and chapter 9, you will see how God already knew who he was going to use. God knew he was going to use this guy who was a negative guy, but had all of these commitment issues in the right place. He knew how to be committed. And God says, I'm going to pick a chosen vessel to take the gospel to the Gentiles. He didn't pick someone uncommitted. He picked someone who was committed. Someone that when his heart was changed, those same disciplines in his life would be pro-God instead of anti-God would be pro-Jesus instead of anti-Jesus, would be pro-church instead of negative church, would be pro-heaven. It would be everything that God wanted to be. Now, again, we're just measuring where we should be. And he was a man committed to Christ, and, and there's the question. If, if we looked at our commitment, measured against Paul's, would I be safe to say that most all of us would not measure up? Amen? I, I am included. I am included. Now, he, he starts to give up some things. And you've got to remember, 
he, when you start thinking about his commitment and what he accomplished, it's going to be a pretty big thing. So here's the first thing I want you to write down because it gets a little complicated and you're going to have to stay with me. You can make it easy by, by just giving affirmation that you understand what I'm saying. Here's the first thing I want you to write down. When it comes to this dirty word in the church, because commitment, is, it's not about excuses. Remember, the buts and the excuses are the byproduct of lack of commitment. Okay? I've used them. I know them. I know all the excuses. Matter of fact, some of them I created. I did. I, I created some of them. I tried to justify. Uh, and, I, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Because, see, the more we think we know, the more we think that we can kind of twist things to make it fit our lifestyle. But in reality, God says it the way it's supposed to be said. And we don't get the opportunity to twist what God said. We have to do it the way God said. Here's the first thing I want you to write down. What have you been willing to count but for loss for Christ? Verse 7. Paul says this as we have the background. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Let me just stop there. Those things that were gained to me, they occupied that special attention or time. I count them as loss. In other words, he had all of this plans. I don't, I don't know about you, but... But especially this time of year, young people, you need to have a plan because life's going to creep up on you. And if you don't have a plan, you're liable to go down a path that's not really the plan that God has for you. Take some time and, and really think about your goals. Think about what you, you want God to do. But Paul said those things, I count them as loss. What have you been willing to count but loss for Christ? Now, the key word is willing. What have you been willing to let go of? I can't answer that for you. You have to answer that. It's a rhetorical question. It's one of those questions uh, that makes you think. What have you been willing to let go? Paul said those things that were gained to me, he let go. There are a lot of things that you've got to be willing to let go of. Okay? And I can't answer what they are. See, for Paul, everything was nothing compared to serving Christ. Let me say that again because that's a big statement. Everything was nothing compared to serving Christ. Now, I don't know why it is that we have to live most of our life till we realize what's really the most important thing in life. Because when we're 30, we don't think like we think when we're 40. And when we're 40, we don't think like we think when we're 50. And when we're 50, we don't think like we think when we're 60. And you say, how do you know? Well, I'll be 63 in just a few days, or a couple of weeks, and I can assure you I think much more differently now than when I was 30. And thank God for that, because at 30, I was dumb as a rock. Wasn't much smarter at 40. Didn't get a whole lot better at 50, and I pray God's grace at 60. Amen? And you realize what's more important the older you get. And I don't know why it takes us a lifetime to see it. That's why, I, I, I think why is because I didn't measure myself the way that I should. I felt I was in ministry, and that was enough. But I think if we constantly measure ourselves, we are able to make the corrections necessary so that we're not so dumb at 40. And not so dumb at 50. And we don't have to wait till we get to 60 till we realize what's important. And that's why you need to listen to 50 and 60 year old people and 70 year old people because they've been there, done that, and they're going to help you if you'll listen to them. Amen? Because we, we all know the mistakes we made. And Paul says that everything was nothing compared to serving Christ. So, what is something you could give up for Christ's sake? What are you willing? Now, this is, this is what are you willing. This is the easy one. This is what you're willing to do. And some of you are having difficulty right now saying, oh, man, he might ask me, what am, what, what am I willing to give up? And if I called out your name and, and said, what would you be willing to give up? Would you have something on, on your mindset? See, for Paul, he gave up his career. He was willing to give it up. He was willing to give it up. You say, you're telling me to give up my career? I'm not telling you to give up anything except what God tells you to give up. Maybe your financial plan. He was willing to give it up. Because, see, some of you are doing your plan and your plan ain't working. You're living from payday to payday and paycheck to paycheck. 
And you're not honoring God. Amen. Let's just be honest. The truth will set you free, John 8, 32. Amen. It'll help you. How do you know? Been there, done that. Been there, done that. You say, you robbed God? Oh, man, I was a thief. Way back in the beginning, I thought I had a better plan than God did. You say, I, I can't believe you're telling us that, that, that you were a thief and you robbed God. I just love my kids, love my wife, didn't have enough faith to trust God. I love God, but I thought I knew better than God in the financial plan. And guess what? I didn't. I was stupid. I was dumb as a rock. And I missed out on all the blessings I could have gotten. And boy, then when I started to practice what God said, the blessing started coming. He opened the windows of heaven, poured out a blessing so great, have trouble receiving it even to this day. I'm telling you, are you willing to give up your social life? These things, Paul said, I count all those things but loss. What have you been willing to count for loss for Christ? Your social life? Let me just say this right now. There's some folks running with some folks you shouldn't be running with. Got to be willing to let it go. Got to be willing to let it go. And maybe you could give up this, the thing that takes almost all of your time and attention. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it was. I know for me, there were some things I had to give up. And when I gave them up, I was willing to give it up. And I never missed it. I never missed it. I, I mean, when I, when I said, Lord, here, I can't do this and do this. And when I let it go, I didn't miss it. See, God has this incredible spiritual way of filling every void in your life when He's first. He fills every spiritual void in your life when He becomes first. When you start to give up something and replace it with God, you will find the peace that passes all understanding. You will find joy unspeakable and full of glory. See, what, what this really boils down to, what really has priority in your life? What are you willing to give up? Now, some of you are thinking right now, I don't know if I've ever given anything up. Okay, if you're at that conclusion, then I think you really need to spend some time and evaluate yourself with your commitment. With your commitment. I know it's a dirty word. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to help you. I had to do it because there are some things. They're not bad things. They're not things that you would say are wrong. They're not things that would get in the way. But what are you willing to give up? What has the real priority in your life? Because if the greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength, if it is, and we don't do it, we're not living according to the great commandment. We're living according to what we want. And God wants to bless you. God wants to give you all of these things. And, and I can promise you and assure you this. When you get to the place when you're committed to where, where, where you feel comfortable in the realm of serving God, you will be the happiest you've ever been. And you will have the most joy that you've ever been. So what have you been willing to count but loss for Christ. Because Paul said, but what things were gained to me, these I've counted loss for Christ. Well, let me give you another one. Write this down. Be careful how you write it down. Because it sounds almost like the other one. What have you been unwilling to count but loss for Christ? It's easy to give up stuff that we're willing to give up. It becomes difficult to give up stuff that we're unwilling to give up. Verse 8 says, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. There are some things that we're willing to give up, but there are some things we're not willing to give up. And the things we're not willing to give up are the ones that really get in our way when it comes to understanding and learning more about God. In other words, when we serve God, do you, do you understand that Jesus was our sacrifice? And when we serve God, we need to live sacrificially too. There are some things that we have to be willing to give up even though we're unwilling to give up. we got to let it go we got to let it go. He said, I count all things lost. The great minister George Mueller, and I've referred to him several times in the past, Mueller was this great minister that ministered to orphans in England. And he, he, had, and he never asked anyone to support him. 
All Mueller did was pray. Mueller was this great vessel of prayer, and but as he would pray about the needs of the orphans, and, and, and by the way, it grew over his lifetime, he ministered, to, they estimate, over 2 million orphans. And he never had a society that, that created anything. He would pray, and God would always somehow meet their financial need. But Mueller said this. He said, giving is not measured by what you surrender to Christ, but, 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 but by what you hold back. Now, again, he's talking about giving. Everybody in here is probably thinking about money. But I believe when we serve Christ, God's not necessarily interested in our money as much as He's interested in us. How much time do we give other things that we don't give to God? I know, I, I mean, because I love my plants and I love the yard, I love all that, but if I'm not careful, I'll spend so much time there and when I compare it to, to, to what I've given to Christ, I'll think, wow, I've robbed God again. Our time has to be appointed that we're willing to give it to God. The things that are important to us. And, and, and he said it's what we hold back. It's what we hold back. And this is true of dedication or commitment. That dirty word again, commitment. What are we holding back? What are we unwilling to do? What you hold back or unwilling to, to go or let go of measures your commitment. I bet for most of you, you would say it's time. It's not money. Your time is probably the most important thing that you want. How many would agree with that? Say amen. Especially as you get older, you think you don't have enough time. And you missed out on a lot, and now you've got to the place you don't have as many bills, and you want to take time to do some things for yourself. Can I get an amen? Amen. Yeah, amen. And that's a good thing. It is. It is. But I will tell you this, that the time that you set aside for God, the more time you give God, the greater pleasure and life you're going to have. You will. You'll find time for all the other stuff you want to do. And you won't feel guilty about it because right now, if you're not giving God the time, the time you take for yourself, you're feeling guilty about. You miss church, and even though you're doing something fun and good and needed, you feel guilty about not being here. You lived almost in a condemned state when you've been redeemed, and you should be happy, but because you robbed God of the time that something deep inside you says you should give Him, you feel guilty. And thus, you don't feel the joy that you should feel. I'm just saying there are some things that we have to do in our life. And for many of us, it's time. And you've got to find some time. So I'm, not, I'm unwilling to give some time back. I, I've done my time. I hear that in the church. I've done my time, Pastor Mike. I've done my time. As long as you are living, you have not done your time. You are still in time. And the time appointed to you is not yours. It's His. Amen? It's controlled by Him. It's not controlled by you. I've done my time. You had not done your time to your home in heaven. Amen? Time is the most important thing. Maybe you say, no, it's my freedom. I like where I'm at in life being able to do what I want to do. Can I get an amen from that? That's good. Amen? I like being there too. I like, I like the freedom. I, I, Phyllis and I were talking today. I, I like the fact my kids are grown. I don't have to change their diapers no more. I don't, I, don't, I don't have to get up early and take them to school. I don't have to do homework with them. I don't, I don't have, they've been to college. They've graduated. They're, they got jobs. They're good. I am glad my nest is empty. Aren't we, baby? We are. I like my freedom. I don't have to call a babysitter to, for us to go out. Any, we can go on a date any time we want to go. I don't have to worry about who's going to care for the kids. I like my freedom. Amen? I don't have to worry about... Uh, well, anyway, we'll just leave it all alone. But I like my freedom. Do you like yours? And boy, it's a big thing. But see, a lot of people, they don't want to give up their freedom. But the problem is our freedom becomes misappropriated. Where my freedom really comes is my freedom in Christ. And Paul was committed to Christ as a slave. The Greek word is the word doulos. It means bondservant. Every time he writes a, an epistle or a letter, he says a bondservant. 
That means I'm a slave by choice to Christ. And he had this incredible freedom. Many people think when you come to Christ, you've got to give up everything. When you come to Christ, you don't have to give up anything. You don't have to give up anything. But there'll be a lot of things you give up because you just want to give them up. You don't have to give them up. You'll just want to give them up. As you discern what God wants you to do, and you'll find great freedom in that. Freedom comes when there's no guilt. And if you're having guilt, that means you're not living free. So Paul said, all things I counted as loss. I gave it all up. Everybody say all. You say, now, Pastor, wait a minute now. Are you telling me to give up all day? I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm just telling you to measure where you're at with your commitment. There are some things that you've got to give up that you're unwilling to give up so that you truly can be free in Christ. You've got to let it go. Maybe it's your time. Maybe it's your freedom. Maybe it's your will. Maybe you say, I, this is just what I want to do. If you're a strong-willed person like me, what that really means is we're stubborn. Strong-willed people, that's a nice way to say that they're stubborn. Amen? And sometimes we just don't want to do what God wants us to do. We're unwilling. But I can promise you this, when you do it God's way, you will always find it was the right way. You will always find it was the right way. Let me give you the third thing. I'm just talking about measuring your commitment, using that dirty word in the church, commitment, because typically when I talk about commitment, everything gets really quiet. You know why it gets quiet? Guilt starts to set in. We like to think he's talking about somebody else, but in reality, we all know he's talking about us. Can I get an amen? I mean, you say, well, I mean, I, and, and then, then we do this. Well, shoot, I'm better than so-and-so over there. I mean, you know, I, 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 I am. I am. That's why I said we can't compare to one to another. The, the one that you really need to compare to is not even Paul. What you really need to compare to is yourself. Judge your own heart. Let your own heart condemn you. Because it will. And that's a good thing because the Holy Spirit is showing you. He guides you to truth. And truth leads to repentance. Repentance. As we acknowledge where we're at. And again, I said, if you would look at yourself and measure your growth, you wouldn't have to wait till you're 60 till you think you got some of it figured out. You'd have some of it figured out at 40. And at 50. You don't have to wait. You don't have to struggle. Here's the third thing. How long has it been since you thought or measured your growth in Christ? Verse number 12. Let's look at this. This is important. Paul says this. Not that I've already attained or I've already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold on to me. Now, he said, look, I haven't arrived and I don't have all the answers. But I, I want you to understand this. That Christ laid hold of me and i got to get to the place that I lay hold of Christ. I mean, Christ has wrapped his arms around Paul. And let's face it, we all got to get to the place that we wrap our arms around Christ. We all talk about I, I, I was coming in this morning, and we were listening to KSBJ, and I heard that David Crowder song, Oh, How He Loves Us. Is that the title, right? That, that Katie sings so well. I love that song. I love the lyrics of that song. Uh, but here's one thing I started thinking about. That whole song is about how much he loves us. And, and the lyric, I told Phyllis, wouldn't it be incredible that you could write lyrics like that and you thought about God's love in such a deep, intimate way that you were so gifted to do that? But then it hit me. We're always talking about his love for us, we need to have some songs about our love for Him. Remembering what He did for us. We talk about His love, and boy, it's good. And we talk about all the verses, how God loves us. And, and we all do our amens and our amens, and they sound good. But how does it count when we measure up? How much do we love Him? The Scripture says we love Him because He first loved us. And if we're more God conscious and we're, Christ is more real in our life, we will, Paul says, I, he has, a, uh, has wrapped his arms around me. Look what he says in verse 12. This, this, is, this is a good verse. He says, not that I've already obtained or I'm perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. In other words, he loves me and I need to lay hold on how much I love him. I need to love him in such a way that there's no doubt. 
See, our love relationship with Christ should be seen by everybody we know. There'd be no doubt who we're in love with. There's no doubt I'm in love with my wife. There's no doubt she's in love with me. But I want it to be no doubt that I'm in love with Jesus. Amen? I want my grandkids to know it. I want my kids to know it. I want my congregation to know it. I love the Lord. I love Jesus. And, and sometimes I am lack on that commitment, and I forget the fact of how much He loved me. And when I start to forget the fact of how much He loved me, then what happens is I don't love Him like I should. And thus my commitment is not what it needs to be. Paul said, not as though I've already attained. And see, most of us take a false assumption of ourselves. We think we got it together. In reality, we don't. We think we've arrived spiritually. We got this church thing, this Jesus thing, this salvation thing worked out. I don't think you ever get it worked out. So what are you talking about? I don't think you ever get it worked out because the longer you live with Jesus, the more you discover how much he loved you and how much he did for you. And it becomes so real that every day you see him in a different light. You see him as this incredible diamond that has a different sparkle or facet to it. And that, that, it, we can't make that false assumption that we got it together. Paul said, I, I want you to understand, I don't have it together. I haven't obtained. I, I hadn't got there. Because, see, when we think we got it together, we stop working trying to be better. And we don't have to work to be better in Christ, but we have to work better on our commitment to Christ. I can't be any better for Him to love me anymore. He loved me at my worst. But I can certainly love Him better than what I love Him in the way it's shown. Amen? I can give Him more of my time. I can give Him more of my heart. I can give Him more of my mind. I can give Him more of my pleasure. I can give Him more of my freedom. I can do much more. And, and when I measured what He did for me, it'll never measure up. Paul is not speaking of salvation, but he's speaking of his commitment. This has to do with spiritual growth. This is the inward man. This is, you know, a lot of us look at our outside. God's not concerned with your outside. Man is. God's concerned with your inside. When your inside is right, your outside will be okay. Amen? And you'll find incredible freedom. You can take the vacation. You can go to the lake. You can do this and not feel guilty because your inside is right. You are laying hold of Christ the way Christ laid hold of you. His priorities become your priorities. I promise you, you'll still get to do all the things you want to do if you'll listen to me. I think of all that Paul had attained. I, I, I think about what he had done. The many converts the churches, the three missionary journeys. But I think of the persecution and the discouragement that he faced. Now think about this. Think about this. I, I want you to think about it in such a way. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> I, want to, I want to just give you, a, a, just, a, a, just to remind you, because most of us have really never given up too much for the cause of Christ myself included, we're, we're privileged people. God hasn't required much of us. God hadn't put us in harm's way where we've had to make uh, choices like Paul had to make. Uh, most of us have prospered since we've become a Christian. Amen? We, we've sat in air-conditioned buildings. We've heard preachers preach eloquently, and we've heard preachers preach like knuckleheads, but we've heard great music. We've uh, gone to church fellowships. We've had freedom in our country. Uh, let's be honest. Most of us have not had to give up much to serve Christ. Amen? We've become spoiled. If we don't like this church, we'll go to another church. If Pastor Mike's too long or he gets too much in my business, I'll go find somebody who won't say anything that'll make me be offended. I'll go find... We, we, we have all kinds of freedom. We've never, ever been able to suffer. One of the things the team's going to find in Haiti, they're going to find, they're going to find what they got is more important than what they realize. They really are. They're going to see some poor people who have nothing that worship with no AC, with dirt floors, and just the precious Word of God, and it's going to change them. Look at Paul. I didn't forget about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says this. I'll just start at verse 23. And again, talking about suffering for Christ. 
Verse 23, are they ministers of Christ? He said, I speak as a fool. Now, he, he, he's becoming, he's a little upset here because he's telling them what's happened to him. I am more. In labor is more abundant, okay? In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, more often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. He was literally whipped. 39 lashes with a whip or a cat of nine tails. Five times. Once I was stoned. Given up for dead. They threw rocks at him. They were going to kill him. That means a bunch of people gathered in a circle, put him in the middle, and they all had rocks, and they kept throwing until he fell like he was dead. I was stoned. He's just telling us now. He's been beaten with rods, once stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. And, uh, a night and a day have I been in the deep. Not only was I shipwrecked, but I was, I was, I was marooned in the deep in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the cities, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils in false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside the other things that comes upon me daily, my deep concern for the churches who is weak, and, and I am not weak, who is made to stumble, and I'm not burned with indignation. In other words, Paul said, I went through all these other things, I built churches, I went on missionary journeys, I suffered. I worried about how people's spiritual condition was. I fell under the pressure. And he, and he says, in all of this, he's, he's going to say, in all of this, he did it for the excellency of learning more about Christ. He never complained. He suffered all of these things. He did all of this. And yet he never complained. You're talking about commitment? Most of us, we wouldn't come to church if we lost air for three weeks. We'd endure today, but we'd be calling, hey, did y'all get the air fixed? Uh, can y'all call me or send an email when it's out? Because I'll come back when the air is on, amen? My point is this. we got to get to the place that our circumstances do not drive the way we think. Christ drives the way we think. Our relationship with Christ. And yet, Paul was not satisfied. He wants to be closer to Jesus. If you go back to the text... You go back and look. He said, I hadn't arrived. I don't know everything I need to know. He says, but this one thing I do know. This one thing I do know. I'm pressing forward. I'm not discouraged. Let me ask you this question. Was there ever a better day in your Christian life than today? Was there ever a better day in your Christian life than today? Think about it. And it's not wrong to say, yes. I can remember when. I can remember when. I can remember I used to preach in the jails. I used to love it because, man, I, I, we'd see people, you call it jailhouse salvation or whatever you want, I'd preach in the jails and there'd be 30 people saved. Man, there were some good days. I, I love it. You say, well, they got saved in the jail. I don't care how they got saved. Let God worry about that. I just present the gospel and let the power of the gospel fall where it falls. Amen. But isn't it, isn't it funny? Jesus said, when I was in prison, you visited me when I was in prison. When you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. See, we can't equate the seriousness of it. Were there better days? So I, I can remember preaching in services where we'd, we'd get 30, 40 people saved in a service. Were there better days? Surely there's been some better days for me. Surely there have been some better days for you. But if there were a better day then, then our, our goal should be, I'm not satisfied with where I'm at now. I want to get back to that better day. I want to get back to when I knew I served Christ with all that I had instead of me sitting on the sidelines now. Was there ever a better day? And if there was a better day, then something has changed in our commitment. Something has changed. So how long has it been since you thought or measured your growth in Christ? Let me give you one more. Still with me now, say amen. Because we're just measuring and talking and looking and doing. We're, got, we're good on the time. Don't turn look at your clock. Don't look at your device. Don't worry about it. I only have this one and part of another one, and we're done. But I'm telling you, as a guy who, who has spent his... You have to understand, I have spent my whole adult life in the Scriptures. That's crazy. My whole adult life I have spent in the Scriptures. But here's the sad thing. 
after spending 40 years plus years in the Scripture, you don't get it till you get older. Now, either I'm really stupid, and that could be, or I'm really hard-headed, and that's so. But isn't it great that God has never given up on me through the whole time? And He's never given up on you? And when you think about, you live most of your life, and you really don't have it figured out till you get toward the end of your life, and then the number one thing you want to do is to share what God has shown you with other people so that they don't make the same mistakes. That's why I'm talking about commitment, folks. That's why I'm talking about measuring yourself. I'm happier now, and Phyllis and I are happier now than we've ever been. True statement. And it may be because the kids are out of the house. I don't know. But we're happier now because we have matured to the fact that we realize Christ has laid hold of us and we've laid hold of Christ. And we haven't got all the answers to everything. But this one thing we know, we're not done. We're not done. We're not sitting on the sidelines. We're not letting somebody else do our job. Matter of fact, we're more passionate about our job than we've ever been. We are more serious about proclaiming Christ than we've ever been. We are more concerned about you learning about Jesus and learning about life than we've ever been. Why? Because time's running out. Time is running out. And that's what Paul says. And you can't let, here's the fourth thing, are you letting things of the past hinder your service for Christ? You said, we're talking about commitment. Here's the thing that people do about the past. Bad things hold them back. Good things hold them back. Some of you were so good in the past that you think you can hang it up now because I was so good in the past. You're only as good as what you did for Jesus today because you still stand before Him today and have to give an account. You're not going to be able to reason when those pearly gates open and you stand before the Lord or at the judgment seat of Christ and say, Lord, 20 years ago, remember, I did this. Remember, Lord, how we used to teach Sunday school and all of those little kids got saved 20 years ago? And here's the question you're going to get. What have you been doing for the last 20? What about all the kids that have come along since you quit? What about all the people who needed to hear about my son and what he did since you quit? Now, I'm not telling you this to make you feel guilty. I'm just telling you when you stand, you want to hear, well done. Not well said. Well done. Wouldn't it be great if Christ came back? We're busy about the master's business. I promise you. You, that, not, that might not mean much to you now, but when you get 60, that's going to mean a lot. You want to be busy about the master's business. Because you're going to have to give an account. And that's what Paul says. Forgetting those things that are behind. It includes the bad. It includes the good. Some of you say, I did some, made some mistakes. I, I messed up. I really screwed it all up. I, 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 I just was a failure. And, and, but listen to me. You've got to let that go too. This great guy that I talked about, the Apostle Paul, do you understand he was persecuting the church and throwing people in jail and he was consenting to the murder of Stephen? The stoning of Stephen? There were some things in his past he had to let go. There's some things in your past you better let go. There's some things in my past I better let go. Because if I don't, they're going to stand in my way of giving Christ my all in all. And there's some good in my past I need to let go of. I don't need to stand on the laurels of what I used to be and what I used to do. I ran across some old, uh, used to be at church directories. Y'all remember those? They'd come, they'd take our pictures, and then try to get us to buy the pictures, and then we'd get a free church directory for it, you know, and you could call everybody. And we were looking at those not long ago, and I was thinking about all of the people in there, 
All of the people. And it was amazing how some of those people I'd won to Christ, how some of those people had went into ministry. And it was great to reminisce. And then you start looking at the events and how they went to camp and how they did this and all the big plays we used to do and the big dramas we used to do. And if you're not careful, you'll start living in the past. I don't want to live in the past. I want to live in the now. There's some people in this room that need Christ today. I don't want to say, boy, I, 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 we did all this in the past. I want, to, I want to be effective now. I want to find a way to reach people now. I, I, want, to, I want to share the gospel now. I, I, want, I want to hear the Lord uh, when, when I pray. I want, him, I, I want to have that, that, uh, that, that anointing, that sense of well-being that I have uh, pleased Him today. Not 20 years ago. Not 10 years ago. See, there's some old ways that hinder growth and they have to be done away with. And we got to be careful that we stop grieving the Holy Spirit. Because some of us, we let our past get in our way and it makes us angry. How many of you ever looked at your past and you get angry because of your past? Well, that's good. But then we get angry about a past, we start getting angry with other people that were in our past too. Well, they made me do this and this got in the way. And Ephesians 4, verses 30 and 32 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Listen to me. When it says one another, do you understand it's talking about other people, but it's also talking about you? Some of you have got to forgive you. You've got to forgive yourself. And quit living in the past of your failures and quit living in the past of your, of your successes and let's live for today with our commitment today because we're measuring our commitment. Let me give you fifthly, if Christ called you back home or came back, would you be ready? Because commitment's an important thing. Dirty word in the church. I know people don't like to hear it. And it makes you feel bad. Some of you have tuned me out. Some of you are not going to be able to tell anybody what I said because you didn't really want to hear about your commitment. You wanted what you wanted. I get it. You wanted your freedom. You wanted what you, what, what, what you did. You're at the place in your life where you just don't need anybody telling you about anything. As long as God is on the throne, God's going to be telling you about what He wants. And He's going to be speaking to you through the Holy Spirit. And if you're riled up at all, then the Holy Spirit has at least stirred something in you that made you start to analyze. Amen. If Christ called you home or came back, would you be ready? See, that's why I said when you're 63, you do, you do realize that you're a little closer to Jesus than most people would think. Life expectancy is not that long, right? That's why the Bible says our life is but a vapor. Amen. When you get all this white hair, silver hair, whatever you got, or no hair, you're getting close to Jesus, man. Amen. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And we're all terminal. We're all terminal. All of us are going to die. It's appointed unto man wants to die. And after this, the what? The judgment. It's appointed for every one of us to die. There is a day. We don't know when that day is. That's why the commitment's got to be good. And we've got to get to the place. And Paul says, look, I'm reaching forward. Look what he says. I haven't apprehended. I haven't. As, as he looks at these things, he talks about it. I forget those things that are behind, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and I reach forward to those things which are ahead, and I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm pressing harder than I've ever pressed in my life. Because I'm going to meet him soon. Sooner than when I was 30. Sooner than when I was 40. Sooner than when I was 50. Sooner when I was 60 and I'll be 63. I'm going to meet him sooner. Amen? And Paul said, man, I'm pressing forward. And I'm reaching forward. 
I'm not backing off. I'm not sitting on the sidelines. I'm not keeping my trap shut. It would be a crime if I kept my mouth shut. I got 43 years of studying the Scripture and discerning what God would have us to do. I've got two doctor degrees. I've read more books than you can ever put together. I've got so much in that I wanted to come out. It would be a crime, Paul said, anathema me if I can't preach the gospel. The older we get, the better we should be. The older we get, the happier we should be. The older we get, the more joy we should have in our heart. The older we get, the more love that has been shed abroad in our heart because we've had all of these years to learn about how much God loves us. The older we get, the wiser we should be because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And at 63, I know God's on the throne, and I know His Word is true, and I know I am His child, and I'm heaven-bound, and whether anybody likes it or not, I know I'm forgiven, I know I'm redeemed, I know I'm anointed of God, and I know He loves me for 63 years. He has told me that. So why do I want to sit on the sidelines and let other people do it? You ain't getting my blessing. You're not. You're not getting my reward. Amen? Paul said, I'm stretching and I'm reaching. What's he reaching for? The prize. The prize. Some of us think when we get a certain age, the prize is not important anymore. The prize is always before us. The prize of the upward call of Jesus Christ. The prize of seeing Him one day we get in heaven. Heaven's going to be great, but the greatest thing about heaven is you're going to see Jesus. Man. Are you reaching for the good things of God? Stretching and training. 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 I, you know what? I'm, I'm going to share something with you. I still get excited about teaching the Word of God. I get, I, I get upset when it don't come off the way that I feel it should come off. Everything's got to be right. I'll come tell Phyllis and she'll say, well, what are you going to be teaching on this week? And I'll start telling her and I give all this history stuff and all this research and I, I spend all these hours doing this and I get excited about it. And I said, and, 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 and I look at her and she's like, I lost her somewhere along the way and she's looking at me with those, that glazed look, you know. And, 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 but I get excited about it. You know why? Never gets old. Never gets old. Never gets boring. Never gets boring. Never gets boring. I love to tell the old, old story how a Savior came from glory. Mm. How He made the lame to walk again, caused the blind to see. I heard about the angel singing and the old redemption story. Man, let me tell you something. It never gets old. It, it never gets old. Are you still in the race, folks? God's not done with you yet. God's not done with you yet. If, you, if you're young out there, get in the race. You can do it. You can achieve it. I promise you, you'll be shocked how fast you can run if you just get in the race. Are there spiritual goals in your life? Are there spiritual goals? I was, we were talking not long ago, and I had the opportunity to go to the University of Liverpool. It's an extension of Oxford, and that's my invitation only. I've had that opportunity twice. If I get that opportunity again, I'm going to take it. You say, well, you're 63. Your time's done. I don't care. It's a spiritual goal. I turned them down twice. They, if, they, if they call me again or send me a letter, I'm going to take it. And you're going to have to help pay for it, amen? But I'm going to take it. You say, we well, already got a church. It, it's not about that. It's about learning the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I haven't attained. I hadn't got there yet. Terry's done, almost done with your master's degree, right? You'll be done. What's that? Two, two more weeks? Two more classes. Two more classes. Two more classes. 
But this one will tell you. You're going to get those two classes done. You're going to wait a little while. And then, then you're going to say, you know what? I think I want to go back to school. I think I'm going to get that doctorate degree. I want, to, I want to learn. I want to get some more. You know why? Because the more you learn about Christ, the more you want to learn about Christ. Are there spiritual goals in your life? Some of them are simple. Some of them are about the basic things about giving, about attending, about loving, about forgiving. Those are simple. There's some deep spiritual goals. There are some people that went to Haiti. That was their spiritual goal, to go on a mission trip. I'll venture to say there's some on that mission trip that God is going to call to be a missionary. I don't know who they are. I don't know if it would be this trip. But I know that there will be a spiritual goal in somebody's heart after they surrender to that. Don't be afraid to talk about commitment. It's not a dirty word. It's a way we measure ourselves. You know what Paul just did when I gave you everything that he did here? He talked about commitment. He constantly analyzed himself. And at the end of the day, when it was all done, because he, he always said, I'm the least of the apostles, but I'm the chief of sinners. You never get to the place where you think, I've arrived and I've got, I'm a spiritual guru and i got it all together. The more you learn about Christ, the more you learn He's got it all together and you live and you breathe and you move in Him. So where are we at today? Kenny, why don't you come in? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you just a moment to pray about your commitment. That dirty word. <laughs> that dirty word. Pray about it. Pray about, think about. Think about how you used to do things a different way, how you used to read your Bible, <clears throat> how you used to pray, how you used to give, how you used to witness, how you used to see how God would use you in certain situations, how you would teach your class, how you would serve as a deacon. how you would present ministry, how you and your family would serve God. Think about those goals that you used to have. And so along the way, they just stopped. You quit doing them. And it's not because God left. It's because we just quit being committed the way that we once were. I'm not saying you don't love the Lord. I'm just saying that we just got too many things in the way. Well, here's what I want you to do. If the message spoke to you today, just get up right now and come to the altar. No fanfare, no raising of hands, no pray. The Word of God has just convicted your heart. Just come to the altar right now and pray. And look, all you're doing is asking God to put you back in a place where you once were. It's your choice. Just get up and come right now. Come on. Praise the Lord. That always is the best way, is just to let your heart drive you. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray for these that are moving right now. Lord, I thank you that the Holy Spirit is just speaking to hearts all over this building. And Lord, I pray they'll know this was not a message of condemnation. This was just a message of self-examination. Father, I love these people, and I know you love them, and they love you. And, Father, the reason they came this morning is to renew that relationship, to reestablish it. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that has spoken to our hearts this morning. This great number that's come that's renewing their commitment. Father, I see so many young people that are struggling about a purpose in life. And, Father, I pray right now you'd speak to young people. You'd speak to that 20-year-old or that 30-year-old and, and just really reveal yourself to them. That what a vessel. We're losing an entire generation of young people, Lord. And I pray that you'd speak to the young people in this building today, that they would be the vessel. They would be the conduit that would reach their age group and 
Christianity would not just be an old person thing, but it'd be a, a thing for all people. But Father, speak to our young people here this morning. Speak to our young couples. Renew in their heart their zeal for you. Let them be bold. Let them be brave. Let them be committed to the things of Christ. Let them be willing to count all things as loss for you. Have your way. Christ's name I pray for all of these that are at the altar and those that are in their seats. Amen. If you're in your seat this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you can receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior by just inviting Him to come into your heart. He's already spoken to you. You've already felt that tug. You've already felt that, that feeling that you can't explain in your heart. <clears throat> If you'll open up your heart this morning and say, Christ, come into my heart and be my Savior, He will. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done, He will. He'll love you. He's loving you right now. You say, Pastor, I'd like to do that, but I, don't, I really don't know how to do it. Just raise your hand and I'd pray for you. It's amazing when you raise that hand of acknowledgement how the Holy Spirit will show you what you need to do. Is there any like that? that needs Christ as their Savior, just raise your hand. Maybe you're visiting. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Why don't we just give the Lord a hand clap offering this for loving us so much this morning. Just, just for loving us, just for just being such a gracious, redeeming, forgiving, good God that He is. I mean, we can be scoundrels, can't we? We, we can be absolutely devious and, and, and wretched sometimes, and, and God still loves us. And, and that's just grace that's so amazing that we should just praise Him for who He is and what He's done. Uh, it's been wonderful to speak to you. Again, I know there are many, many people that have graduations. You're going to be traveling. Be back in your place. The Lord always has something good for us here. Amen. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Love one another and have a great day in the Lord. God bless you. You're dismissed. Amen.